We read this morning from the book of Genesis in chapter 1 and from verse 26. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, and according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the living, uh, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed, to you it shall be for food. Also to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the air, And to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food, and it was so. Then God saw that he saw that he had made, and indeed it was very good, so the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the hosts of them were finished. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. This is the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created, in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, before any plant of the field was in the earth, and before any herb of the field had grown, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the earth, and there was no man to till the ground. But a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of, the, of life was also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it parted and became four river heads. The name of the first was Pishon. It is the one which skirts the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. Bedelium and the onyx stone are there. The name of the second ro- river is Gion. It is the one which goes around the whole land of Cush. The name of the third river is Hidekel. It is the one which goes toward the east of Assyria. The fourth river is the Euphrates. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat For the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. The Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all cattle, to the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field, But for Adam there was not found a helper comparable to him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the place, the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man, and Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. They were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's come now to God in prayer. Let us all pray. Our gracious God, as we are 
reminded by your word this morning, you are the God who has made the heavens and the earth. The stars are the works of your fingers. You spoke and it was done. And all that you made, you saw to be very good. And we bow in your presence this morning to bring you the worship and the adoration of our hearts, acknowledging that we are made of dust. And who are we that are but dust and ashes to come into the presence of so great and so glorious a God? But we thank you that you have made us for communion with yourself, a communion that has been destroyed and shattered by our fall, our sin and our rebellion, but is restored in the Lord Jesus Christ, whose likeness his being is being increasingly impressed upon the people of God. And we pray then that as we have this great and glorious privilege this morning, that we may come with boldness and confidence to the throne of heaven, knowing that you receive us because of the Lord Jesus Christ, because of that righteousness of his that is perfect and complete, that is imputed to every one of those who come to him by faith. Thank you for the gift of faith and the gift of repentance. We thank you that salvation is of the Lord. We know, Lord, that if one, just one tiny aspect of our redemption depended upon the works of our hands, our fortitude, our, our uh, determination, then we would utterly fail of heaven. So inconsistent, so weak and fragile we are. But we thank you that your arm of strength never grows weak. Uh, but you have determined with an outstretched arm to save your people and to deliver us and bring us safely to, pre to heaven and to your presence. And so we thank you that it is with confidence that we engage in worship today, not relying upon ourselves, upon our own goodness or righteousness, but relying upon that righteousness that is found in the Lord Jesus Christ and the empowering presence and gift of your Holy Spirit who dwells within us, bringing about those holy ambitions and desires and aspirations that are not natural to us, that don't spring up in our hearts by nature, but are your precious gift through the new birth. Thank you, Lord, for your kindness and for your mercies and for the confidence that it gives to the people of God that we are your possession and you will not let us go and that you will do this great and glorious work in our hearts. And so we come with confidence asking, Lord, that you do this gracious work within us and bring about increasingly that mighty change that will know its uh, complete consummation in that day when we see God in Christ and are made wonderfully, perfectly like him. Thank you then for reminding us that though we are but dust and ashes, we have been made in the image of God and for God, and we are made to come from this world as we know it into a glorious, a glorious world, the consummation of which will be a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness only dwells. But we thank you for raising our eyes beyond the horizon of this world and giving us glorious ambitions and aspirations to come into that world of eternal joy and bliss and glory, to lay up treasure there, to be preparing for that day today through the means of grace. And we pray that that aspiration will help us sit loose to this world, that we will learn that a man's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses, that we come into this world with a hand grasping, but we go out of this world with hands that are empty and open, possessing nothing except that character that is formed in this life for which we will give an account before you in that day. Oh, help us to prepare for that day. Today we pray through the means of grace, through continual repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and following in his footsteps. Write your law upon our hearts, we pray that we might not sin against you. And in everything in our lives, be honoured and glorified. We commit the opening week to you again, asking that you would direct our steps, that you would strengthen us in every way, that in thought and word and deed, increasingly through this week, we will bring honour and glory to our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Bless our homes and our marriages with peace and with contentment, and our children, may they be brought up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord.
Lord, here we are. We stand before you, a weak and a frail people, and some facing circumstances this week, and they don't know how they'll get through. And uh, they are looking to you, Heavenly Father, to supply their need. Will you not be their help and their strength through this coming week? And, and give them, Lord, such an awareness of your presence for good on their behalf that they will rejoice even in the midst of sufferings. We thank you that our Lord Jesus tells us the truth, that it is through much tribulation that we enter the kingdom of heaven. And that the days for a Christian in this world are marked by persecution and opposition and suffering and also joy. We pray that in all our sufferings we might know nonetheless this paradox of joy in the Holy Ghost filling our hearts and our minds and enabling us to live with this balance in life. We pray for our land. We ask that your grace and mercy will yet be bestowed upon many of our fellow countrymen. We ask for men and women and boys and girls in the community around this chapel and further afield that the gospel will come with power and transforming grace to their lives. We pray that many will seek and find the Lord. We ask that you would bless us continually with uh, peace and law and order and justice in our land and enable our politicians, we pray, not only to uh, protect these things amongst us here, but to promote them overseas. Give them wisdom in that, we pray, and tenacity and success in the work for our armed services, for the police forces that keep our safety and our security. Give them every success in their work against the evil designs of wicked men, we pray. And we ask for those who serve us in schools, in hospitals, and in every way that you'd give them grace and strength in their work and success, we pray. For in these ways, uh, we all benefit. We know the joy of your great provisions for us. We ask all these things, Lord, with the forgiveness of our sins, in the name of our great Redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Turn again to uh, Genesis chapter 1 and 2. On the first morning we began our studies in the book of Genesis. I gave a sort of general introduction to the book, its, its uh, structure and nature and purpose. And then we looked at and concentrated upon the creation of the world by God as Genesis 1 records it, uh, the author, the method and the result of his creation. And then last time we looked at the creation of man and the biblical picture that Genesis gives of the dignity and uniqueness of man uh, as made in the image of God. And now this morning I want us to concentrate our thoughts more upon the gen uh, teaching of Genesis 2 about man in the world and the world that God had prepared for him. The amazing provision that God makes for man in the world as the crown of God's uh, creation. There's no doubt that man is the climax of God's creative work and in a special sense he is the crown of creation, as we saw last time. Well, now, from this point in chapter 2 of Genesis, the book concentrates upon man as the focus uh, of God's purposes, and the history of man's relationship to God especially is unfolded from this point. So from this point, the focus changes to centre upon man's dealings with, uh, God's dealings with man in history. Now, we've already noted the two complementary accounts that we have here in Genesis 1 and 2 of man's creation in chapter 2 and verse 7, and now here in uh, chapter 1, verses 20, oh, verse 27, I should say, of chapter, chapter 1, and then in verse uh, 7 of chapter 2. And as we've seen, those two accounts are accounts of man's creation. We have verse 27 and verse 1. Uh, chapter 1, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And now in chapter 2 and verse 7, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Now, we've already seen that those statements are not contradictory. They are not a needless Repetition, either, either duplication, but there are two accounts that are 
independent, and they're both necessary if we are to understand the true nature of man as God has made him. The first reference there in chapter 1, verse 27, is that man, says that man is made in the image of God. That is his distinct uniqueness. It sets him apart from all other creatures. Man alone is made in the image of God. And then the second reference in chapter 2 and verse 7 tells us that he was made of the dust of the ground. And that's striking, isn't it? What it means is that in the constitution of man, man combines in himself what we might call an infinite lowliness. He's made from the dust of the earth and also an infinite dignity. He is made in the image of God. So man is both dust and glory. And if we are to understand man as God has made him, we have to keep those two concepts in mind. And if you forget or ignore either of those things, then you will inevitably fail to understand man as God has made him. So this is a very relevant matter in our day and generation. Because for some time now, it's true to say that our fellow men appear to be on an endless quest to discover themselves. They're asking, who am I? And they're on the search for a sense of identity in the world. And then the other great question that occupies people's thoughts is, what am I in the world for? What does all this mean? He's on a quest for significance and for meaning. And here we find the answer to these deep-rooted questions, the search for identity and the search for significance. The Bible's answer to the question is that we are both dust and glory. And there's great significance in the fact that man is made from the dust of the ground. Because in Scripture, the dust speaks of lowliness and frustration. It's the word that Job uses when he speaks of of the coming uh, Redeemer. I know that my Redeemer lives, he says, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the dust. Now, I know that our English translations have shall stand on the earth, but quite literally in the Hebrew, the word is dust. He will stand in the dust. In other words, he will be associated with the futility and the frailty and the frustration and the lowliness of human life and existence. He shall stand in the dust. Dust, speaking of lowliness and frustration then, God says in the Psalms, he remembers that we are dust. It's a recognition of our lowly origins, the fact that we are made from the dust of the ground. And so after the fall in Genesis 3, God says to Adam, you are dust, and to the dust you shall return. It's a word that speaks of our frailty, of our finiteness, of the fact that unlike God, we are not eternal. We are not omnipotent. Uh, we are the dust of the earth. So when Abraham at one time comes into the presence of God, he recognizes the glory of God and his own worth in comparison to that. And he says, who am I that I should come into the presence of God who am but God? dust before you. And when scripture emphasizes this aspect of man's nature, it does so for a good reason. It's because if man forgets it, if man plays down this element that he is dust, he will forget and he will play down his creatureliness and his absolute dependence on God. God who you remember from the reading, personally breathed the breath of life into the nostrils of Adam. The very fact that he is, uh, is his dependence upon God, uh, it all comes out in that phrase, doesn't it? And in, the, in that statement, the, God does not do that with any other creature. No other creature do we read that God breathes the breath of life into them. Only man breathing into his nostrils. So the very first thing, as it were, that Adam saw as he woke to life was the face of God breathing life into him. And he was immediately conscious and aware 
of the presence of God and his utter dependence upon God, that he has no life apart from God. But then if man forgets the parallel truth, that he's made in the image of God, well, he'll be content to live like an animal. And he'll fall short of the destiny that God intended when he made us in his image. If, if we believe that we are nothing else but dust, then we'll lose all sense of the true glory of man as the crown of God's creation and God's intended destiny for us. So these two truths, they have to be held together. Man is both dust and glory. He's made from the dust of the ground and he's lowly and dependent because of it. But he's also bearing the image of God and destined for glory. We hold those two things together if we want to truly understand man. Now, in, in the light of that, it is significant to notice from Genesis 2 the provision that God makes for man in Eden. And it doesn't matter to me that we can't find Eden, that there's no geographical location today that we can say this was Eden. It's described here in the text, as we've seen, in relation to two known rivers in verse 14, the Hiddekel, that's another word for the river Tigris, and the Euphrates. The other rivers we can't identify any longer, probably because they no longer exist because of desertification and so on. But it's most probable that the location of Eden, described here as it was uh, to the original receivers of the text, was some place to their east. So it's probably referring to somewhere in the Mesopotamia Valley. But uh, we don't know exactly where, and it really doesn't matter, it seems to me. But the location of the garden, you see, is far less important than the significance of the garden as it's detailed here, uh, as the gift of the loving wise, lavish provision of God for man as the crown of creation, as dust that depends upon God for its very being. So this morning I want us to think about this provision God makes for man in the garden. It's a full and a comprehensive provision, as we read earlier. It's a provision for man in his physical life, for man in his moral life and aesthetic life, in his spiritual life, in his social life, in every aspect of life, God makes a full provision for Adam and uh, for Eve in the garden. It's a provision for, ma for man made in God's image, the crown of creation, uh, because he's made in God's image and because he is the dust of the earth. So firstly then, the physical provision. The physical provision. There's a sense in which the whole of creation was the physical provision for man as the environment in which we live our lives and exist. But you'll remember how we saw in uh, chapter 1, verse 26 to 30, uh, that man was made the vice-regent of God throughout the whole creation. And you see there in that passage how in one area after another, everything is put under the dominion of man by God. When God made the heavens and the earth, the day and the night, the sun and the moon, the sea, the dry land, uh, fish, birds, beasts, and so on, what he was doing is was setting a stage he was creating the environment uh, for man to live as the crown of creation. But then there was two ways particularly in which God provides for man's physical need. The first is in verse 9 of chapter 2, where he gives man all he needs to sustain him. Out of the ground, the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also was in the midst of the garden, and so on. So God provides everything he needs for food. God had already spoken at the end of chapter 1 of the provision he makes for man's physical needs. Uh, God created man and is concerned to sustain man. And here man is being taught to depend on God and to trust God for all of his physical needs. Now we know, don't we, that since the fall recorded in Genesis 3, human greed and sin and folly has robbed mankind of the full sufficient supply that God has made for man in the world. 
And yet even in the fallen world, there is a sufficient supply for all creatures made by the hand of God. The problem that the fall has presented is that now one-tenth of the world's population consume more than a third of the world's resources. It's the result of sinful greed and selfishness. And wherever we see that happening, God is grieved, and we too should grieve that that's the case. To see people enduring hunger should always cause a pang of conscience to the Christian, because it is human sin that is the first cause of that, and it is human greed that causes it to continue unabated. But then there's another area in which this full provision of God that he's made for man should affect us. And that's not only in uh, acknowledging our dependence upon God for all that we have, but also to live in daily thankfulness to God, that he sustains us. Knowing that we are both, both dust and glory, and that God has made such a provision for our physical needs, should produce in us gratitude, a spirit of thankfulness, for all that God gives us. You put down a, a bowl of food for your pet, for your dog or your cat or your hamster or whatever. Well, the dog doesn't come over to you first, does it? And lift up its paw and put it on your knee and look at you and say, well, thank you so much. It just doesn't do that. It just tucks into its food. I hope you don't do that. I hope you give thanks to God for your food. Because, you see, not, we're not talking here about just some old-fashioned habit of good manners. Uh, this is something important. It acknowledges and declares our dependence upon God. The fact that we're dependent upon him for our daily food. I hope you teach your children to give thanks for God and that you do it as families at the meal table. So, gratitude to God is also such an important thing. So God provides for our physical needs by this abundant, sufficient supply of food. And then also we see he supplies our physical needs by the gift of work. Verse 15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. So man was put in the world and it was part of God's design for man in the world to be industrious. Work is a gift from God the Creator. Man is created to be a worker. That was before the fall, and it remains the case after the fall. Though because of the fall, elements of work become drudgery to us. It's marred with a sense of futility because of the fall. But man was made to work. That's why the, uh, the fourth commandment establishes the principle of Sabbath rest, but the command is couched, remember, in a statement about man being made to work. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. So if we are still employed in work, if we haven't yet retired, God means us to be industrious. He means us to apply ourselves in our place of daily work. Laziness, you see, is just as much a part of fallen human nature and humanity as greed. And we would condemn greed. We should condemn laziness. Indisciplined idleness is an expression of fallenness and sinfulness. It's of our essence as creatures made in the image of God to be industrious, to apply ourselves. That's why it seems to me something vital dies in a man when he has no work to do because we live in a fallen society or because we're too lazy to do it or if our only attitude to the work we do is that it's complete drudgery there are aspects of certain work aren't there that we describe as soul destroying and unemployment can be soul destroying Isle, idleness if it's chosen is certainly soul destroying scriptures make that clear to us so God has given us work, tasks to perform. We are created to be industrious. 
So the provision, the physical provision God makes for us, the supply of our needs, the fact that this account in Genesis, a pagan reading this account, his dentures would have dropped out of his mouth in disbelief that God created a world and created a world in which he supplied our needs. The pagan gods, you see, they needed to be supported. They need to be carried around and fed and clothed. Not this God. This God carries us. This God feeds us. This God clothes us. It's an astonishing account. It would have rocked the world of a pagan to read Genesis 1 and 2 and to see the provision God makes. And the provision is the supply of all of our physical needs and the supply of daily work. And then there's the spiritual provision that God makes. Notice that the Sabbath day, the gift of the Sabbath, at the beginning of chapter 2, is the link between the physical and the spiritual provision that God makes for man. Because the Sabbath touches on both areas of, of life. It establishes a rhythm that God has set in society and that he has imposed upon nature. That's why farmers allow fields to lie fallow. Because there's this Sabbath principle of rest. There's this rhythm that is established between work and rest in society. So we read those opening verses of chapter 2. Thus the heavens and the earth were created and all the host of them were finished. And on the Sabbath, seventh day God ended his work which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. God sanctified it. That simply means God, as it were, put a fence around it. He separated it. He made it a day that is special, not only to God, but to man. One of the evidences that we are made in the image of God is that God has imposed upon us this provision of the Sabbath, a day of rest in which we worship God. God blessed the day for the sake of man, which is why the Lord Jesus says the Sabbath was made for man. That is, it was made by God, it was created by God, but man needs it. And the Lord Jesus, he says, is Lord over it. The Son of Man, he said, is Lord over the Sabbath. He's made it for our physical well-being and it's clear that the Lord's Day is intended also to be God's part, this established principle of rest and work given to us. And it's intended for our spiritual needs because the Sabbath is not just a holiday. It's intended for spiritual exercises. It's a day of fellowship with God. And we're to honour God on this day in a particular sense. And it's to our detriment if we ignore it or neglect it. If you defy this principle of the Sabbath day, if you refuse to acknowledge it in the way in which you live out your life, then you are, what you're actually doing is giving sinful expression to your fallenness. You are rejecting the fact and resisting the fact of your creatureliness. God gives us this day to us because we are dust. And refusing to believe that you are dust, you will reject this day. Students working seven days a week in university. Workers working seven days a week. Before long they discover that this broken law will break them. Historically, there have been regimes, haven't they, in the history of this world, some in modern history, who have tried to impose instead a ten-day week upon human beings, working ten days and resting one, only for the experiment to fail miserably every time. And they've had to return to this pattern that God has established on the created order. But then the principle, the principal uh, part of the spiritual provision God makes for man is that the whole created order as God made it was designed, the whole of it, as the sphere in which man would enjoy communion with God, uninterrupted communion with God, of knowing the bliss of God's presence, of hearing God's voice, of opening his heart to God. It's that, ultimately, 
that made Eden the paradise that it was. What made Eden, Eden for man, is that there he had communion with God, for whom and by whom he was made. You were made for that, and I was made for that, for communion with God. And that is where supreme joy and satisfaction is to be found in life. And it's the image of God in you that cries out for that. So much of the restlessness and the unsatisfied longing that there is in the human heart is the outcome of our created nature protesting, as it were, the absence of God. As Augustine so eloquently puts it, uh, speaking to God, he says, You have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. Creation was made as a place in which man's spiritual need would be met through communion with God. And not some kind of vague, mystical communion, but a rational communion. Communion. You see that from verse 16 of chapter 2. It was a rational communion between God and man. Man's intellect finds its highest employment here. The chief glory of your mind is found in the communion with God, hearing his wisdom and pondering God's word and God's ways. The chief glory of your lips is found in prayer and praise to your maker. The chief glory of your being is found when every capacity of yours is bent to communion with the God who made you. And when sin breaks in, what is the first thing and the chief thing that it spoils and disrupts? Isn't it this? Communion with God? That's what gets disrupted. Even when we're in a state of grace, when we've come to the Lord Jesus Christ and found acceptance with God through him, you know as well as I do, that sin cherished and pampered in our lives will spoil our communion with God. It always does. So the spiritual provision. Then quickly the moral, the moral provision. Chapter 2, verse 16. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day you eat of it you shall surely die. What's God doing there? Well, he's giving to the man a moral stimulus. And without this, we will be something less than truly human. This is a, pro, uh, a provision for the moral stature of man. And uh, it's often characterized in terms of prohibition. As if God is always saying, thou shalt not. People protest against it. But as you see in verse 16, the very opposite of that is true. God didn't put man into the garden, did he? And say, now you don't touch anything like you do when you take the kids into a, a, a shop full of expensive and lovely things. You, you don't touch anything in here. God doesn't put man in the garden and speak like that to him. He says, it's all for you. All of this. Everything you see, everything made by my wisdom and love, it's all made for you. But there's one thing, just one, that you must not touch, the tree in the middle of the garden. Part of God's purpose for, you, for us, you see, is that we should learn moral obedience to him as our creator. Because we are dust. It's important to see, you see, that God sets down for us the proper bounds of human freedom and liberty. God says, you will be free so long as you live within the bounds of my law, of my commandments, which is not a burden for you to take up, but a blessing to embrace. Now, sinful people find it very difficult to believe that. Fallen man believes that freedom, true freedom, is found in breaking out of God's law and commandments and disobeying God. But what we find is that when we do that, we become slaves to sin, which is exactly what the Lord Jesus said. He who commits sin is the slave of sin. For Adam in the garden, true freedom lay within the bounds of God's commandments. 
We are made for God. The psalmist says in Psalm 119, Thy hand has made me and fashioned me. Oh, give me wisdom that I may keep your commandments. That's where freedom is found and liberty. So the moral provision. Very quickly, I'm conscious of time going. There's an aesthetic provision. Did you notice in verse 9? Out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. Not just good for food. Pleasant to the sight. We live in a time when people are obsessed with usefulness. The usefulness of things. God's also concerned about beauty. And he is concerned with beauty because man was created with a capacity to appreciate beauty. So he made things pleasant to the sight. And it seems that that's a unique capacity found in man. Beauty is put into our environment for us to appreciate. You don't find two cows leaning over a fence, turning to each other and saying, What a lovely sunset. Isn't that wonderful? They don't do that because it's just not in their nature. It's not part of them. And it's a mark of sin in us and its effect upon our lives when we become bored with beauty. God has given us a capacity to appreciate beautiful things and he's made a world of beauty and he made it with beauty for you and for me to appreciate and enjoy. And then quickly there's a social provision. Verse 18. The Lord God said, It is not good for a man that man should be alone. I'll make a helper comparable to him. There was one thing lacking in creation, one thing lacking in man, that was his need for society, for companionship. And God saw that. And again, that rises from the fact that we are dust. We are dust. If we were only and entirely in the image of God. If we were like God, we would have no need of anything or anyone. But because I am dust, well then I'm created with certain needs. And one of my needs is for company. I cannot be so taken up with my own private life, even a private spiritual life, that I cut myself off from other people. Nor must I be so absorbed with animals and the companionship of animals that I make those a substitute for my communion and fellowship with other human beings. God brought all the animals we read to Adam but a helper suitable to him was not found amongst the animals. It's important to notice that we're not made to find our social company with animals. The companionship of an animal can be a rewarding thing on a number of levels but for fellowship we must be in the company of other human beings and of course we ought to be mindful of that uh, of that need in others and help meet the need in others it's not good for man to be alone we need to think about that but then the special relationship that God has created to supply this need in us is marriage. That's what Genesis 2 is teaching us here, the joining together of a man and a woman. I just want to say quickly five things about marriage. The first is the relationship is complementary. The real meaning of the phrase, a helper comparable to him, uh, quite literally is a helper opposite to him. That is a helper who matches him and mirrors him who is complementary to him with an e not an i so that the co they complement each other and that's what marriage is intended to be that sort of relationship so that in every sense as it were the one completes the other the second thing is clearly here that it's monogamous as distinct from polygamous it is a man united to his wife and they become one flesh. The third thing is it's very decisive, isn't it? Verse 24. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. There's something decisive about the marriage bond as God creates it here. So that it's not something into which people sort of slide. Well, it sort of seemed the next thing that we should do. It's not something that we have a trial Let's see how it goes. 
for a few months first. No, marriage is a decisive act in which a man leaves father and mother and cleaves to his wife, his spouse, and they become one flesh. There's something very decisive about the marriage. And it's fourthly permanent. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave, be joined to his wife. They'll be, he'll be bounded, bound together with his wife. Marriage is a union God intends to be permanent. And marriage, verse uh, the fifthly, is uh, a means, not an end. Marriage is like every other gift in that sense, a means and not an end. And the end of every gift that God gives is the glory of God. And so though marriage is to be an exclusive relationship in the sense of it being between one man and one woman, it must never be exclusive in the sense that other people get shut out. Shut out from your compassion, shut out from your companionship, shut out from your fellowship. Marriage should never be like that. A marriage is not to turn in upon itself or very soon it will sicken and die. It's not healthy for a married couple to be so wrapped up in each other that they have no time for anyone else. Marriage is a means to an end and the end is the glory of God. But then I do need to say that though marriage is a gift from God, it doesn't mean that marriage is something that we can't live without. You sometimes hear preachers very foolishly saying, you're only half a man if you're not married. Or if you're a single woman, you're only half a woman. That is not only nonsense, it is heresy. It's heresy. We're not thinking clearly when we say such silly things and hurtful things. It's foolish and it's heresy simply when you begin to think about the Lord Jesus Christ, you see the folly of such a statement. Are we saying the Lord Jesus was only half a man? That he was less than a man because he was not married? You see how serious it is to make silly statements like that. Nonsense and hurtful. We can live without it. But the primary means that God has given for our, com our companionship is this uh, provision of marriage. So what have we learned this morning? God has made us from the dust. We'll know futility and frustration. We are aware of our finiteness because we're made from dust. We are dependent upon him. He has made us in his image. So we bear the image of God and we are destined for glory. And he has made a lavish provision for us. He has left no aspect of our lives unprovided for. And we've learned that your freedom and humanity is uh, found only in living in the bounds of God's perfect will for us. And that's where we become true men, true women, living before God. Well, may he bless his word to us this morning.